Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Today's guest is Rajat Mishra, the founder and CEO of Present.ai, the presentation productivity platform for enterprise teams, which recently closed a $4.3 million funding round. He's also the president of Presentium, a business presentation firm. He's also the executive producer of Think Deeply, Speak Simply podcast, which talks about the art and science of communicating ideas. He formerly ran the $14 billion customer experience business unit of Cisco, which consisted of over 1,000 team members. While the original goal of the conversation was to discuss business presentations, we went deeper and discovered how his family is a huge part of his companies and his life, and the lessons they're learning from working together. You'll learn about why he started his company, how he includes his family in his work, how he gives back, what he has learned, and where he is going next, and more. I was really inspired by his lifestyle and his journey because he grew up in India and learned IT like a lot of Indians do and come over to America for work. And he was able to build a life, build a career, build a family, and now to build companies. And I wish more people had this opportunity. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Rajat Mishra, a very humble and knowledgeable man. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Rajat. It's nice to meet you and learn more about your company and what you're doing and why presentations are something that needs to change. Thank you, Sean. So why don't you introduce yourself real fast, tell everyone a little bit about uh, what it is you do and how you came to the idea that you need to start this company specifically. I am an ex-corporate person turned entrepreneur. So uh, right now I am the founder and CEO of Present.ai and I'm also the president of a presentation services firm called Presentium. We help large enterprises with their presentation needs and helping them save time and making their ideas shine. You got a question on how we got here. I've always wondered, being in corporate, I worked at McKinsey and Company for a while, Microsoft. Before this, I was a senior exec at Cisco Systems. I've always wondered uh, why there is no enterprise-grade um, productivity platform for presentations and communication. So every function in a company has an enterprise-grade productivity platform, like sales has Salesforce. Right, finance has you know financial force. Ticketing has service now, uh, but companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of hours on presentations. Like Thirty billion hours are spent every year by people making business presentations, uh, but there is no enterprise grade platform. So that was the problem that was kind of vexing me from an efficiency perspective and from an effectiveness perspective. Most people are not trained in the art and science of business communication. So a lot of improvement can happen, right? So I've been thinking about both these aspects and uh, that journey eventually led us to founding the services business presentium and the software company also. I want you to tell the story briefly about how you got to the first one and then it led you to the second one because you had told me that and I thought it was really cool because most people jump right in and I think what you did was really smart. So I'd like people to know about that. I was an executive in corporate America and my wife and I, we both worked at McKinsey and she was an executive in, uh, in healthcare. So we were not 21 year olds out of Stanford looking for a business idea and nothing to lose. So we, uh, you know, I remember this discussion in our kitchen table a little over five years ago. We said, look, it feels like there is an efficiency and effectiveness problem here. If you think 30 billion hours are being spent every year, multiply that with $100 an hour fully loaded cost. You know, that's a you know, multi-trillion dollar problem. And at least half the time is getting wasted. Many friends have come to me and said, Rajat, I have a great idea for a presentation, but I don't just don't know how to say it, right? So both anecdotally and from a data perspective, we knew this is a huge problem to solve. And no one was really doing it because most people in the space are designers. So we said, look, instead of kind of going all in, quitting both our corporate jobs, you know, we have two kids, 
and a mortgage. So we said, you know, maybe we should be a little um, planned about it. And so we said, why doesn't, why don't one of us keep our job? And why doesn't one of us go and start a services business? Uh, and the goal of the business would be to learn more about the customer, learn if people would actually pay for business presentations, uh, gain some insight, because I, I've always believed that success comes from privileged insight. If you don't know something more than someone else, you know, why would your business be successful? So that's what we did actually. So I continued at Cisco and I kind of grew the ranks from being a corporate vice president to a senior vice president there. Meanwhile, my wife, Deepthi, she quit her job at Genentech and she started a services business called Presentium, which offers a very simple but powerful service that you send your presentations, unclean, dirty presentations or draft presentations by 5.30 p.m. in the evening. And next day morning, you get polished presentations ready to use. And uh, she started that about five years ago. And over the last four years, and you know, kudos to her. She and her team grew that to supporting thousands of users and over 50 Fortune 500 companies. So we do thousands of slides every night. Uh, we have you know, hundreds of people on the team. But the most important thing, Sean, was we learned a lot about the actual customer, what their pain points are, right? We learned a lot about making presentations and we built over a million slides and 50,000 presentations. So we also learned about the metadata. I've always been thinking about what's the right time to join her and build the software offer, which would complement the services. But when COVID hit, I realized, okay, now this is the right time. People are more open to working remotely. You know, number of presentations, Sean, actually went up by 150% in COVID because more people were communicating remotely. And we also had the customer contact. We had thousands of customers we could just sell the software into because most startups struggle with who should the customers be. And we also had this metadata set and know-how. We had the team. I was running a $14 billion business at Cisco, but my dream has always been to build this company and help millions of people. So I quit my job. When we started off, we said we'll put the first million in to see if we can build a product that has some traction. And in March, we released the alpha version of our software offer. And what was very heartening, Sean, was that, you know, customers loved it. They told their friends, started using it. And then people started asking me, hey, how much do I pay for this? And the idea wasn't to like sell it as a paid, uh, as a paid product. So we said, maybe this thing is working. And then you know this, like, you know, machine learning engineers are not cheap uh, and designers. So we said, maybe this is, uh, we've got some customer validation. Maybe it's time to um, raise uh, an external round, get some funding. And it's not just for the money, uh, but also to work with people who can be thought partners and partner with us in this journey, right? So very, very fortunate that we were oversubscribed by more than double for our round. And we've got an amazing group of you know, corporate executives, uh, founders of unicorns and decacorns, and some VCs that I know who are my friends. So everyone in this round is a personal you know, one or two degree connection. And it's been amazing to um, get so many people interested in building this you know, productivity platform for presentations. That's what I noticed doing my seed round was that I already knew those people or they were a friend of one of the people that invested. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because it's so early, they're kind of, in a sense, they're betting on you, right? Because they know the idea might pivot. Uh, but it was a very um, humbling and scary experience at the same time. So now there are so many people betting on this. We want to make sure we do it right by them and, you know, do it right for all the people who've left their jobs and also joined this company now. So like you, I put my own money into my company until I raised from external investors. Now I've, before I did the raise, I was concerned that I would feel more stressed by having investor money in my hands. But what I felt afterwards was actually relief because I knew I didn't have to pay for the company anymore. What was that like for you? I, I do feel a sense of responsibility for everyone. But what, what has always driven me is I want to make sure that the idea reaches its full potential. It's a greater responsibility to remove any roadblocks which prohibit the idea to reach its full potential. And capital should not be one of those constraints. I think bootstrapping is fine, but on the margin, I found myself you know, making decisions which would have either slowed the company or limited reaching its full potential, which is a little bit easier to do when you have a little bit more capital, right? So now when I'm faced with a decision, I can say, look, if I go this path, I could save a few hundred thousand dollars. But if I go this other path, this company can truly reach its potential of helping millions of people get better at business presentation and save time. I feel stronger now with the capital and I feel I can really push the envelope and uh, 
help the company realize its full potential. So did any of these investors be like, okay, here's millions of dollars. You need to spend this in 12 months. Like you need to spend this. Do they give you any of that kind of pressure? Because I hear that some VCs do that, but if they're like your first or second connections, I imagine that maybe they're a little bit nicer. Yeah, so one of the discussions I've had, um, I, I was a PL owner myself, a general manager, right? Many people who are investors actually are people who've run businesses or built businesses themselves. And uh, they understand that what we're trying to do here, we're trying to build an enduring business. And an enduring business is only built when the business model makes sense. And it, it takes time to figure out the business model. One of the phrases one of our investor uses is go slow to go fast. What we want to do is in the first six months, I think all of this year, is figure out we have the right product, uh, the right go-to-market model, right? We have the right set of customers because not everyone is your customer. Basically, get the right product market fit. So I don't want us to scale or go exponential without product market fit and not just on the product side, on the go-to-market side, team side. And once we have those pieces in place, then we can always accelerate. But I did not get that pressure. In fact, since most people have run businesses, it's harder, I think, if you work with someone who's who's more of a financial numbers person and has never run a business before because all they see is the ARR number. I'll give you an example. In the last month and a half, I sent two kind of short emails to my investors, right? One of them was how customers are growing and ARR is growing. People were happy. Then I sent them another email, which is one quote I heard from one of our customers saying that, you know, this product has literally changed my life. I was spending so many hours of presentation that I was spending, now I'm spending 20% of that. And the response by the investors to the second quote, Sean, was a lot stronger than the first one about numbers. These are all business people, guys and gals, and they understand that if customers love your product, everything else is noise, right? So the most important thing is to get 100 customers who you don't know who love your product and tell their friends because behind each of those 100 people, you know, there are another thousand that you can go and mine, right? So that's been my experience and I'm fully focused on making sure customers love it. So uh, I don't want to scale it too fast till customer success is ready. I don't want to scale it too fast till you know, the product analytics is ready. Once those things are in place, you know, there is infinite scaling as possible, right? Because the market for this is trillions of dollars. I mean, that's been a concern of mine is if we get too much money too fast or the people we partner with may not understand what we're doing, it may push us in a direction that I'm concerned about or may push us to go too fast. I've been going slow as well. And that's why I spent the first few years kind of just funding it myself because I wanted to make sure that we had that freedom. And we're also trying to work really hard on establishing our high level processes across all of the departments and then creating like a data pipeline so that things flow and there's no silos ever anywhere. And so my COO is amazing with all of this stuff. Like I could never even begin to think about how to do any of this. I'm in the camp, get the foundation right. I've known many friends who've um, scaled businesses to you know hundreds of millions of dollars only to fall back down very quickly because the business model is not sound, right? So I'm focused on making sure the business model is sound and the product market fit is strong. So you mean you don't believe in injecting billions of dollars into research and development and marketing with no idea of whether it's going to work or not? <laughs> I mean, call me old school, right? Because because I was a general manager in a large company, I, I take a look at the PL every month are we spending things on the right thing, uh, starting small and then tweaking things if they work, right? Recently, we gained even more insight into who should the initial sale of the customer be to. And then now we are dialing that up. That's what a startup is, right? You're a bunch of hypotheses to be proven or disproven. So as we prove or disprove a hypothesis, we know a little bit more and then we can scale it up or down. Is anything in your tech related to the actual uh, psychology of it? Like how, how, what makes your platform unique? I'm so, sorry, I, I have like this investor hat on at the moment, just thinking about it. I mean, I'm not going to invest, but. Uh, the way I like to describe it is you need to codify empathy, right? Because at the heart of being a great communicator is to empathize with who you're speaking with and then tailor your communications to them. If you have to, if the goal is to codify empathy, you need to understand how people are different. First, understand who you're presenting to then understand how they are different. And then as a communicator, take that into account to create a great presentation. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to crack the code on codifying empathy, understanding how everyone is different, and then using um, the rich data set that we have. We have the metadata for over a million slides, not the actual content, but the metadata of who presented to whom and things like that. So using that, come up with, um, based on who you're communicating to, you have a certain set of personality traits and the person you're presenting to has a certain set of personality traits. Maybe it's not one person, maybe it's a group. And then also the kind of presentation you're doing, you know, if you're talking about growth, 
It's different than if you're doing a monthly update, right? So all that context is pregnant with empathy, right? So how do you codify that, understand that, and then translate that into rules and uh, technology and machine learning recommendations so people become more effective. So that's what we're trying to do. We do have an element of beautiful design. We do have a learning component. We have folks like Guy Kawasaki who talks about how to make things simple. You know, you mentioned body language. We do have a high stakes professional poker player who talks about how do you read an audience, just like you would read a poker table. And so there is a learning component for our communicators, how they can get better at communicating, delivering, understanding cues. Uh, But really the heart of it is codifying empathy and then helping people save time. It sounds like a complicated system, but I think that can be good for you in terms of defensibility. Some company founders want to keep their raises private and others want to make them public. The reasons why they might want to make it public is to make it easier to hire people, to attract more potential investment or free PR, et cetera, et cetera. The reasons why they might want to hide it is to prevent competitors from knowing they exist or to copy their ideas or go, oh, wow, they just raised 10 million. Like, yeah, I'm going to go build this and, and raise 5 million and try to beat them on price or whatever. I heard about your raise. So obviously you went the public route, but how did you actually feel about that being publicized? It was a deliberate decision and it's for the reason you said it's for hiring. As we scale and as we need more people, I think you need need that story and need that PR. I understand it from the point of view of a machine learning engineer or a designer. They read things in the media and it gives them more confidence that yes, this company is going to be around. And did you have any other companies that were larger than you come to you about partnership or acquisition or anything as a result of the of the promotion? I cannot divulge any names, but we've had people who've come to us to learn more, you know, have the exploratory conversations. It's too early to think of that. Right? We are, we're in the entry stage, right? We are starting. There's a long way to go. Is that AI capable of recognizing something is beautiful or not, or making a recommendation about beauty? I'm a computer science engineer. So what we've done is we've codified what we think good design should look like. We've broken that down into um, 60 plus traits, things like what, what makes a presentation kind of a good design or beautiful, and then start learning based on what people are using and what people are liking. That's the engine. And um, again, I don't know if we are going to crack the problem fully, right? but that's the, that's the path we are on. What is your definition of a good design on a, an individual slide basis? What we always say is the audience is the hero. You cannot take a slide and say this is a great slide or this is a bad slide without knowing who is it being presented to and what is it being presented for. So that's what I mean by you need empathy and design going side by side. So maybe someone creates a beautiful visual and presents it to me, but I won't like it because I hate I hate images. I like clean lines and less less on the slide. But there might be someone who would love that. That's the hard part, right? Not just creating multiple types of designs, but then also saying what will work for whom. And also it depends on the company context. Having spent so much time in corporate, there's a concept of tribal knowledge or company culture, right? So how do you bring that into the tech also, right? So it's not just design, not just the empathy, but it's the company, right? It's the person listening to it. And every function is different, right? What finance finds beautiful, marketing may not find beautiful, right? Or what finance finds appealing, marketing may not. Those are the dimensions of the problem to be that need to be taught to. Did you build your deck using your own software? Yes, of course. And how long did it take for you to close the 4.3 million? It took us a month. I mean, the legal paperwork and all the terms and all that stuff took a little bit longer. But and like I said, you know, most of these people are people I've known for years, right? They were also wondering, you know, why would someone leave a senior executive role in a large company? You know, I was fortunate to be one of the top you know, 30 people in Cisco, which is a company of 70,000 people, leave that to pursue this. And people who have known me for a while know that um, I have a lot of passion for communication and democratizing communication. So this has been, um, at some level, Sean, I feel this is my life's purpose and I'm going to spend the next 10 years either failing miserably or uh, or coming up with a solution that can help help millions of people. I feel like you'll fail miserably along the way to discovering. I, I feel like we have to fail. Like I probably fail multiple times a week in what I'm doing. Just like opening my mouth to say something to my to my CTO and then my COO was like, oh, why did you say that? <laughs> don't don't say that. Next time if you want to say that, ask me first. Like yeah. every, you know, I think every day is an opportunity to fail, I think. You know, there's a great speech, right? Um 
I think Roosevelt's speech about man in the arena, right? Where he said that uh, it's not the critic who counts, but it's the person who is in the arena. I'm paraphrasing, but he said some things are worth doing even if you fail. And if you succeed, you succeed greatly. But if you fail, at least you failed with daring greatly, right? And Brené Brown took that to make her a book also, right? About daring greatly. So in a sense, I feel that's what we're trying to do as a team, not just me, the many people with us. They're daring greatly and trying to solve a problem which may or may not be fully solvable. But so far, the uh, data points seem, seem like we're moving forward. Theodore Roosevelt says, nothing in this world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, and difficulty. No kind of life is worth leading if it's always an easy life. I know that your life is hard. I know that your work is hard. And hardest of all, for those of you who have the highest trained consciences and who therefore feel always how much you ought to do. I know your work is hard, and that is why I congratulate you with all my heart. I have never in my life envied a human being who led an easy life. I have envied a great many people who led difficult lives and led them well. Well said, Sean. One of my favorite books, Sean, is uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. There's a quote in that book that says that if you can see your path laid out in front of you step by step, it is not your path. Your path is the one you make with every step you take. That is why it is your path. So the Hero with a Thousand Faces was first published in 1949 by Joseph Campbell. And George Lucas acknowledged him and he said that it was a huge influence on the Star Wars films. What Joseph Campbell says is, most stories follow the same arc, the arc of a hero with a thousand faces. It starts with someone who has a calling, and you can take like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, Karate Kid, take any any kind of movie or even people's lives, right? Uh, you have a calling, you kind of follow the calling, and then along the way you find a mentor, and then uh, things go bad, you go into the abyss, then you find someone that helps you, and then you come back with something of value. It's a great book because it's like a meta book. Most books follow that that journey. And that's what he talks about, right? Is people say they're trying to find the meaning of life, but what they're actually trying to find is the experience of being alive. I mean, I don't know you that well, but it feels like it's what we're trying to do, right? It's the experience of being alive and you feel more alive in, you know, solving this problem in a way that the collaboration problem that you're solving for teams in a way that has not been solved. And you want that experience. And so do I, right? For me, that comes from building a company with people I love working with and then eventually solving a problem at scale. And all the you know happiness and sadness and ups and downs that come with the journey, that's all part of that experience of being alive. That's what I want. I think entrepreneurship is, it's like crazy. The whole thing is nuts. Anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur has to have some level of craziness in their personality in order to be successful at managing all of those ups and downs. No, you're right. I mean, I mean, George Bernard Shaw says a long time ago, right? All progress belongs to the unreasonable man. And I did that as all unreasonable men and women now, right? Because if you're reasonable, you'll play along with how things exist. So you have to be unreasonable to a certain extent to say, you know, things need to be done differently. I don't know who said this, but, you know, since, since I've been an entrepreneur, you know, I've been sleeping like a baby, right? I get up every two hours and cry. It's part of the journey, but the satisfaction also is, is amazing, right? To having built something. Every day I get to see hundreds of people who have logged into the product and are using it and how their time is being saved, right? And you can see the potential of how that can scale. So yeah, so I think, you know, and, and you're you are living through that and so have I, and I've, I've chosen that life and I would, there's nothing else I would rather be doing than building this company with the set of people that I am. I would rather wake up every two hours and cry than work full time for somebody else. It's not the, that the other life is bad, right? It's, it's a choice you want to make, right? People have different uh, aspirations, right? And that's a great path too. You know, going back to that empathy, I'm, I'm empathetic to everyone who, who enjoys a steady professional life and people who try to do something unreasonable with a high risk of failure. For example, one of my friends called me before we did the recording and she's like, okay, I'm driving down from Orlando. I'll see you in a few hours. Thank God it's Friday. And I was like, yeah, for you, I've got to work tomorrow. But you know, Sean, I mean, what I've been thinking about is so, you know, I, I've got two kids. I think one needs to have some kind of, you know, I call it work-life harmony. Right? There needs to be some harmony between your life and your work. It's going to be a 10-year journey building this. Otherwise, things will break down, right? So even my 10-year-old son, you know, if you look up his LinkedIn profile, his LinkedIn profile, he built the profile. So one of my team members actually sent me a note once, look at this LinkedIn profile. And I opened it. It was my nine-year-old son back then. He's created a profile saying he's a customer success associate at Presentium. And his job is to make sure everyone has a great experience with the service. And he's been reaching out to people telling them about, about the service. So, so it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit about integrating that into your life because this concept of, okay, you know, it's Friday and now the weekend is, I'm going to do something that I wasn't doing during the week. 
I think that's not a scalable model, right? So my wife and I, I mean, we're doing it as a family business, right? With at really high stakes now, it's like a high stakes poker game. But I think we've integrated our kids into it. We, we are trying to find a way, I'll say, because otherwise it's not sustainable, right? Because this is not something I want to do for six months, raise a bunch of money and sell the company to someone. I don't want to do that. I want to build an enduring business that will help millions of people. And that's going to take 10 years, right? Just to be realistic, right? Everything takes longer. Everything is a little bit more expensive than you think, right? So I want to find a way to be a dad and kind of be an entrepreneur. And I, and I think it's possible. I don't think it's a zero sum game. My daughter, she's six, you know, when she, when I say I have a meeting, you know what she asked me? She asked me, dad, is it a customer meeting or an internal meeting? So she knows that if it's an internal meeting, she can come in and ask kind of what she wants to ask. But if it's a customer meeting, she knows, okay, you know, don't disturb dad at this time. So it's like those little things. Everyone in the family knows we have two kids, but we also say, you know, the, the company is another child that we have. And we're trying to raise all these children at the same at the same time as good parents. So I know that makes sense, but that's kind of a philosophy we are trying to adopt. Otherwise, it leads to burnout. Otherwise, it leads to kind of hating what you're doing because then it's then it's at the expense of something else. You know, Ray Dalio is one of my um, uh, people I look up to. You know, he runs Bridgewater, right? the largest hedge fund in the world. And in his book, Principles, he says something very interesting. He says, when you are faced with two choices that seem to be at odds and you want both of each, so like in this case, you want you want a life. You also want to build your company. He says, when you think the two choices are at odds, you got to slow down. And he says, there is always a path where you can get a lot of both. You just haven't figured it out yet. So that's what he talks about, right? So I, I really don't think life is kind of either or choices. I think I think if you slow down, you can find a way to be determined. There, there is a way to get not all of both at the same time, but maybe you can kind of sequence things and, and get as much of both as possible. And again, I think it's a different stage, right? I've, I've been running a business for 20 years. I'm not 21. So the way I'm going to approach building a company is going to be different than someone who's 21, who has no kids, you know, who's, who's not married, who can do it in a different way. So, so that's our approach we've, we've taken. And maybe we can reconnect in a year or two. And I can tell you, Sean, how, you know, we can give ourselves a grade of how that approach went. But I, I would rather do it this way than build something unsustainable and not just and one of the practices I have that end of every month, we actually do a monthly assessment of uh, family, health, and business. How are things going on all those three aspects? And the beautiful thing is about having all three things going at the same time is even if there's trouble brewing in one, the other two give you balance. Like my son is re running for student council elections today. And last night we spent time on a speech and you can imagine he has a very professional looking poster made uh, for his thing. And that brings a little bit of joy. And, you know, I had to get up a little bit early today to meet a customer because I spent time with him yesterday, but, but that's fine. I would rather make those micro choices all day long so I can run this business and be a dad to my kids too. Yeah, it's a fantastic way that you're doing it. It's definitely interesting. When I was younger, my, my dad was a dentist. He had his own practice. So I would go to the office with him sometimes and I would talk to the patients and like, I didn't know what I was doing. I was young, but they liked me being around. I was this cute little energetic blonde haired kid and, <laughs> you know, just like very positive and saying hi to everyone and all that. Yeah. And then yeah. I ended up working with him as I got older, like more in a professional capacity and all that. You remember that time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The definitely positive experiences. I'm curious, since your son is a customer success, I don't remember the title, are you giving him a salary for this? Is he saving for college with it? Or? So for the family side, he does he does get paid a you know, very small amount. All that money goes directly into his Roth IRA. And he has picked a Vanguard fund that he likes. And all his money every month goes into that fund. And, uh, you know. No Bitcoin? He's anti-Bitcoin and, you know, I have some percent in it. This as a hedge against the dollar. You know, the other thing is, you know, like we talked about balance, right? The other thing that Deepthi and I decided is uh, we'll give back. So we don't want to wait till we're 60. So like for our Presentium business, for every slide we make, we give a dollar to a children's charity. And like I'm on the leadership council of No Kid Hungry. I didn't know one in seven kids in the U.S. actually are, um, are at the risk of hunger. And then we also are building a medical campus for, uh, for Sonia Nebeda Foundation in Uganda, which helps kids with type 1 diabetes. And I'm also on the board of an orphanage in India. So we're trying to kind of create a life, Sean, that has, like I was saying, multiple bottom lines. So build a company, also try to give back, you know, be there with kids. And, and this is also integrated with the business, right? Because even the giving back, the people we work with, um, you know, they support us. They sometimes they make, they tell us what they're doing. We let our employees know we're doing this. It makes everyone feel good and gives more meaning to kind of what we are doing, right? And in the end, everyone's looking for meaning in their lives.
I would direct you to a charity called Pencils of Promise. They build schools around the world for like villages and people that are really poor. So they they put in 90% of the funds and the other 10% comes from the the, the local government and the community has to actually supply the the lumber, like they have to supply the raw materials and build it with their own hands. Oh, cool. So the government provides a local teacher and they work with them on the curriculum and all that. So they're not here's, you know, $20,000 go. It's like they're building a relationship with the local community. They're forcing them to take responsibility for their kids' future. And, you know, the community, the government and them are all partners in the long term to make sure that these kids are getting good education because the guy's philosophy is like he was traveling around the world when he was in his early 20s and he realizing that like some of these kids that he saw on the street, they're like begging for money. So you start talking to them. You're like, you know, if you could have anything in the world, what would it be? And they're like, I want to go to school. I want to learn. Yeah. And so he's he like had this six figure job in Wall Street and he quit his job and and started this thing off of nothing and built it into something. I think they've done over a thousand schools in the last decade or something crazy. So what do you say pencils with? Pencils of promise. Promise. Great. Yeah. So no. like I donated 500 for my birthday. I would like to support them through the company once we have the means to do so because we don't have any revenue yet. That's awesome. And I think it's a lot of kind of where you come from, right? So I grew up with nothing. I grew up in India in a middle class family, right? So when you grow up there, kind of, I can totally relate to the story. You know, the IITs in India was my ticket to a different kind of life. It's always something you can, you remember where you're from. And I'm only grateful, right? I mean, my life, Sean, has exceeded all my wildest expectations. If you had asked 10-year-old Rajat, you know, you would be in Silicon Valley building a company and you have a thriving business and, you know, you have two kids, getting to do what you want to do, uh, helping people. Like, I, this is only the only gratitude I have, I have for this. And uh, I'm also excited for kind of path forward. I grew up in an upper middle class family in America. For the average person like me, it's very difficult to understand what life is like outside of America growing up. But because I've spent the last 15 years of my life living in those countries, yes. I've seen what poverty is. Yeah. And sometimes I'm in America, I'm in America now, and I hear people complain about like, oh, my umbrella broke, I need to go buy another one. Like some people don't have a roof over their heads, let alone a freaking umbrella. Like, Yeah, I mean, it's all a matter of perspective, right? I think for the person with the broken umbrella, that's probably one of their top set of problems, right, that they are dealing with. And, you know, I think Daniel Kahneman said, right, nothing is more important than the, the thing you are doing at the moment you're doing it, because that's what you're thinking about. So I can empathize with that person with the umbrella. Uh, my dad had a blue scooter. My mom would sit in the back, my brother would sit in the middle, and I would stand in front. And that's how we would drive around, right? So it's just a matter of perspective, right? And you put that person in the umbrella in rural India or, you know, rural Cambodia, they'll come back in six months with a different perspective. So... Is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to add that kind of helps to close this all off? Now, just say that um, everyone realizes everyone deserves a fair chance to realize their potential and communicate their ideas. And that's what we are trying to do, trying to kind of democratize great communication. And um, I just want to thank you, Sean. I think you've been a great host. I think I feel like I'm just sitting in my living room chatting with a friend about all the different things we are doing. And that's the best conversation. Hopefully someone gets, people get something out of it. Let's call it the hero's journey, right? They're to find their own hero's journey. Yeah, though I always do my best to make sure that everyone has an experience with me that they've never had on any other podcast or any other platform they've been with. It sounds like I gave you that and I appreciate that. So how can people follow up with you? I'm actually not on Facebook or Twitter because uh, I have a philosophy that take up a lot of time and mental energy. I'm on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn. You can also look up Presentium, P-R-E-Z-E-N-T-I-U-M.com. We put the Zen in your presentations. And the name of the software is present.ai. It also, it's also spelled with the Z-E-N, Zen. So we are, we are here to put Zen in that presentation process. All right, great. So I'll have those three links in the show notes. And if you like this episode, definitely follow up with Rajat through uh, one of those three methods. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And don't forget that intuition speaks softly and you have to pay attention to what your intuition is saying. Follow your heart and create your own journey. Thank you, Sean.